Hello, Coachella. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that in front of a large crowd. I figured I should just get it out of the way. <laughs> Welcome to the 2015 Banff World Media Festival Unreal Panel. I'm Barry Johnson of A&E Studios, and I will be moderating today's hopefully very lively discussion. So joining me today, thank you. You're starting it off very well, Barry. Okay, okay thank really you. Good. Okay, there's very good. Very lively start. Okay, so from joining me today from, uh, from left to right are Nina Lederman, Senior Vice President and Head of Original Scripted Programming for Lifetime. Uh, Nina has uh, shepherded the life of Unreal from the various early stages to today. Uh, she also supervises Devious Maids. She's developing Damien for A&E. And among the many shows she's had oversight of, oversight were Army Wives and Drop Dead Diva. Uh, next is uh, Sarah Gertrude Shapiro, supervising producer and co-creator of Unreal. Sarah was the writer-director of the award-winning short se sequin rays on which Unreal is based. And apparently, uh, Sarah is a former reality show producer. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> and that brings us to Constance Zimmer, <laughs> stars as Quinn King. Constance has appeared in many, many television shows and movies, most recently House of Cards and Entourage. Congratulations. And Newsroom. She's also in Newsroom. Newsroom. <laughs> we'll have no problem stepping over each other throughout the day. And by the way, anyone else who wants to join in, we probably won't even notice. <laughs> Sherry Appleby stars as Rachel Goldberg. Sheree's work includes Roswell, Life Unexpected, Girls, Her Daughter, and anything else you want to add in. Thank you. Okay. My husband. So, say that again. Her, her husband's a chef. Her husband, John <laughs> Shook, opened his newest <laughs> restaurant in Los Angeles, John and Vinny's, on Fairfax across from Cantor's. Anyone who wants to go, talk to Sheree afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the easiest one right out of the gate. So Unreal achieved its very beautiful look in Canada. Speaking of Canada. Yes. It was produced in Vancouver and was a recipient of the BC Production Service Credits. So can you guys tell us a little bit about your experience producing the show here in Canada? Any of us? Any of us. Um, How thing about you, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in there. Um, one of the miracles was our director of photography, Del David Peltier. Um, who is a total genius and a crazy Muppet. And um, we like to call him the cinematic redneck. He <laughs> likes jet skis and all kinds of fun stuff. But um, Unreal is a really unconventional show in terms of how it needs to be shot. And it needs to be very, very cinematic, but it takes place in a television world. And so finding somebody who could crack that nut with our director who um, did the pilot, Peter O'Fallon, and figure out how to run three cameras at once with cranes and also shoot a show within a show, but have a really, really beautiful, um, well thought out indie film kind of look. Um, I think that was probably one of my biggest questions coming to Canada was sort of who was gonna be our DOP. And that was incredible. Um, and we also had a great experience casting up here too, which I was really happy about. Excellent. Well, and we shot it in Vancouver, yeah. you specifically. But, uh, I didn't say that part? No, you no. didn't. Okay. You just said Canada. BC. I said BC. It's a, it's a very large okay. province. Yes, exactly. So uh, tell, about, tell us about life But no, I, I mean, I would just say, you know, Vancouver was, it was beautiful as far, again, like a mm -hmm. lot of our stuff was night shoots. And so being outside, it was gorgeous. But, you know. We had a crazy hard working crew. They were working with us. We shot, I would say, Wednesday to Friday. We shot through the nights. Yeah. The crew was really supportive really into the show, which was really exciting. Um, and, you know, the weather was on our side. I have to say that we got pretty lucky. We didn't really experience too much of the rain. Mm -hmm. I also, I feel like in terms of the crew being super hardworking, um, there's like a beautiful culture to Canadian crews that I've noticed, which is they're just incredibly polite and humane through very challenging circumstances. <laughs> they say sorry a, a lot, lot. <laughs> <laughs> when it's not even their fault. Yeah, I was actually totally, I was totally freaked out. I remember the first day I got to set, there was some prop, it was like the teacher's necklace or something that I had been so specific about and it got made totally wrong. I mean like totally wrong and I thought and I was like, you guys, I don't know how, how much more clear I could have been and I just could imagine in LA, that being a really different conversation than, oh wow, that's really not how I saw it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, and we're not gonna oh, have a fight? Sorry. sorry. <laughs> I was like, oh. So sorry. Yeah. 
But I feel like it's it's incredible to find crews that can work at that level but totally retain their humanity. It's kind of like the best of both worlds. It's like a really um, sort of life first, human first culture with like really high level professionals, um, which I think is great. So um, I love origin stories. I know there are a lot of interesting origins here, so I'm gonna ask each of us, each of you to tell us your part in the origins of Unreal. We're gonna go back to you again, Sarah. <laughs> so what inspired you to create Sequin Rays? Um, Sequin Rays was a short film that I actually think I wrote for five years or something. I worked and worked on it. Um, it was inspired by a time in my life that I sort of realized um, that the price of my soul was a paycheck. and. It, I had had a few day jobs along the way. I'd been a filmmaker all along, but worked in fashion and reality TV and advertising and had moments in all of those jobs where I was doing things that were so diametrically opposed to who I was that I kind of couldn't even believe I was doing them and got pretty soul sick in those situations. Um, and so I wanted to make a film about that moment in your life after you come out of college and you are really idealistic and think you know exactly who you are and um, just discover how quickly that all falls apart and then how you navigate becoming an adult from there. And so that was so, and Sequin Rays was set behind the scenes on a reality show, it was very much like this world. Um, and it just felt like the most incredible place to set this sort of Faustian tale of like a battle for somebody's soul behind the scenes on a show. Great, so Nina, you somehow managed to get your hands on Sarah's short, or for all I know, you get a digital file and you push a button, What you watch it, <laughs> So what gave you the vision to see this as a, such a provocative and groundbreaking series? Okay. And, what, and then and also please tell us what were your actions that brought it to life? Um, well, it was back in the day when we still had DVDs. Okay. Um, so um, uh, Sally DeCipio um, was uh, someone who worked at Wyden Kennedy and Sarah worked with her and called me up out of the blue. I hadn't spoken to her in about 10 years and said she wanted to show me something. And so Sarah and Sally came down and they brought the DVD and they put it in and, uh, and you know, Jen, who works with me, um, we, we watched the DVD and it was an instantaneous, oh my God, we have to, we have to make this into a TV show. You know, Sarah captured in that, in, the, in that short time, she captured this incredible moment uh, in the elimination and it, it, it was so sophisticated, it was so well written, and it said so much about, about human nature and about what, what these shows represent to so many women, and, and it, it was just pure and dark and nothing like it. And you know, we have a saying in our company uh, that our hair gets on, you know, goes on fire when we see something that we just can't, we can't say no to, and uh, my hair was on fire. That's why it looks so great today. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, it was instantaneous, and uh, that was it. I, I bought it in the room, so to speak, and uh, and and that started the journey, and uh, and never wavered uh, in the commitment for it. Mm -hmm. well, and tell us also, so you, uh, your next step. So then the next, the next step was really, you know, Sarah was a, a young creator, um, and you know, making a television show is so complicated in terms of the creative, but also just thinking about it as a series and not a one-off. Um, and so you really have to, to figure out how to make this show. And you know, we, we asked Sarah to, to, to write an outline and to really develop this pilot, this first episode that was gonna you know, become the, the story that started it all. And you know, truly, Sarah was, um, she was a creator, but, but it was a bigger job than for, for just Sarah. And you know, the truth is, we believed in her enough to let her give it a try first. We did not hand it over to a showrunner until we gave it to Sarah. And we, through working with her, we realized she needed she needed some help. She needed someone who could guide her. Um, and Marty Knoxon was a writer who had come off of Buffy and Grey's Anatomy, and she's someone I wanted to work with. And um, we'd been talking about <coughs> it, but it, it had to be the right thing. Uh, Marty was in India. She came back from India. She had a virus. She couldn't come to the office. I wouldn't send it to her on a link. I forced her into my office. I waited a month. Um, and finally, when she was ready, she came in and sat in the chair. And I said, I want to show you something. And sh we played it. And she was. She looked at it. She said, I, I love it. Are you going to let us go there? And I said, yeah, we want you to go there. We want you to be as dark and unexpected as this little gem 
And so Marty, I introduced Marty to, uh, to Sarah, and, uh, and here we are today. Thank you. So as we all know, the pilot, uh, the first episode premiered just a week ago, but the gestation for these types of shows are lengthy. Uh, Shuri, as you and I have discussed uh, more than once over the last several weeks, tell it, how long have you, <laughs> Tell us, Sheree, how long have you been involved in Unreal, and how did it actually start for you? Well, if you actually want to look at my child's life, she was <laughs> born in 2013. We shot the original pilot, and she wasn't even doing tummy time yet. <laughs> she was six months old, and now she's two and a half. <laughs> so I've been on this pilot for a really long time. I got cast in September of 2013. We shot an original pilot over uh, Halloween in Atlanta. That's when the tummy time was happening. But before that, I'd actually seen the short. I remember reading an article on Deadline that Lifetime had acquired the short to make it into a show, and they had put a portion of it up online, and I had watched it and thought it was really interesting, and it was visually stimulating, but it was a stark story. And so when I got sent the script, it was actually, or I already knew what the show was, but they sent it along with the short, and I watched the short, I was totally blown away, completely floored, and I read the script, and I remember sitting outside with my husband, and I was like, I can't believe they're gonna do this. This is the first audition I've had in, or for a show that I've really wanted to do in a long time. And I, he watched the short with me, and we were both saying, like, you know, I mean, the conversations out there, like, oh my God, it's on Lifetime, like, do I really wanna go do a Lifetime show? I've made Lifetime movies, so let's, you know, let's not put anything past me, but like, um, he was saying, which I thought was a really smart point, like if you can be on a network that's gonna take a chance and make a show that's different and dark and interesting and they're gonna really make the show, this is a great opportunity for you as an actor to be a part of something that's gonna help redefine a brand. Um, so I went to the audition, totally nervous, but really excited. I was like ready to kill and um, I killed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got the job, <laughs> you know, but I've been on the show for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you have any more questions. <laughs> We're going to come back to you. We're going to come back. Okay. So Constance, <laughs> so Nina stalks you at the Oakwood School, yeah. says, hey, I got this show. You really need to be in it. You kind of brush her off. Who I don't, you know. How did it come about? It blew me off. How did this all come about that you ended up we in? We tried to cut you the first time. Right. Well, OK. I, I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. I was approached for the original pilot, and I am going to say this in front of all of you. I turned it down because I did not want to be on a Lifetime show, and I didn't so want to go to Atlanta. It actually leads perfectly into my next question. Okay, so good. Thank you. Uh, and it was shooting in Atlanta, and I had a small child, and I didn't want to leave my kid. And uh, at the time, I don't, didn't even read the script. By the way, didn't even read the script. I just didn't want to go to Atlanta, and I didn't want to be on a Lifetime show. And so they went, they shot the pilot, I went and did other things. And then uh, Nina, our kids go to the same school together. So I was, I was co-hosting the fundraiser for the school with Bob Odenkirk, and Nina pulled me aside and said, I just need to introduce, you. I just need to introduce myself, I'm gonna give you a face with Lifetime, you need to look at me and you need to understand that I am Lifetime <laughs> and I wanna talk to you about this because you need to give us a chance. It is incredible, I need you to see this, I need you to meet with these people. I, I'm telling you, this is your part. <laughs> and I just need you to give us a chance. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm gonna go do some fundraising for our school and I'll talk to you later. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I mean, I will say that having a face with a channel, with a brand, is a huge bonus. And somebody like Nina, uh, especially, because she spoke from her heart. And, you know, we all need that one person in our careers, no matter what we do, to say yes. And to say, yes, we think you're worth it. Or, yes, you can do this. I believe in you. And so I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna meet with Sarah. I met with Sarah, I met with Marty Knoxon. I was also a, a huge fan of Shiri's. Shiri being on the show was to me a big bonus because I had just seen her in Girls and Shiri has been working for a long time and hasn't gotten the accolades that she deserves. I get really emotional. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's, because it does. This show I think is 
comes from, you're, you're going to make me cry. Oh. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really weird. This is weird. Okay, anyways. Uh, so I went and I met with them, and I thought that if they were going to do everything they said, that I, want, I had to be a part of it. Because, uh, again, in that room, I felt like Sarah Short was incredible. And I hadn't read a script, you guys. I never read the script because they wouldn't let me. They said, it's not on the page right now. We need to create it together. And as an actor, you're also like, what? What are you talking about? Like, and they were like, let's talk about this. What do you need? What do you want? What should this character be? And I said, you know, look, I always play the bitch. Like, I got to have, like, just can we make her not just that? I said, that's all I care about. And they will attest to the fact that I was terrified shooting this show. I would, oh my God. I, I would see Nina in the morning dropping our kids off, and I was like, I don't know, I'm so mean, I don't know what's happening, you know? And I would call Sarah, and I would talk to Sherry, and everyone was like, it's fine, just do it, it's all good, it's all gonna be okay, it's all gonna be all right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's incredible to be a part of something that does feel like we're touching on so many things in this business that so many people can relate to, not just reality television, you know? We're talking about uh, families that develop with crews, you know? And that's what this felt like, and I feel like it really shows on the screen, and it's why I think all of us get so emotional about it, because this, is, this was hard work. Mm -hmm. And getting the reviews we've been getting, I mean, I think it's more than any of us. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so emotional. I must be on my period, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's what's happening. <laughs> Barry, you have another question? So, yeah. so <laughs> that means we all Thank you. So, <laughs> speaking of the reviews, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I'm, my opinion is, is Unreal is the most critically acclaimed TV show of the past year. You know, you can look at any list you want. You can talk about Empire, How to Get Away with Murder, Blackish, Bloodlines. Nothing has had reviews like Unreal. It's, it's phenomenal. And even since the show has premiered, they continue to come in. Uh, Sarah shared with me last night that Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 96% approval rating, which is higher than I think uh, they gave the first episode of Mad Men. Isn't that what you told me last yeah, night? Yeah, and Breaking Bad. And Breaking <laughs> Bad, just <Sorry>. saying. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. Yeah, by the way, Entourage only has 33%. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Vulture had this to say, quote, but here comes Unreal, and suddenly Lifetime, Lifetime, they put a lot of emphasis around that, I tried to do that too, has one of the most aggressively interesting dramas in recent memory. So, here's the question, question, Lifetime, really? That's what I get all the time, and I know that everyone here got it. I counted uh, Constance saying, I don't want to work at Lifetime three times. <laughs> So we're asked that question a lot. So by our industry peers, our friends, TV viewers also relate that way. So I ask you guys, how do we overcome, how did you overcome that perception? Because it's like, it's interesting, the show is about perception and reality, and here's our real life, perception and reality. How did you overcome that, that perception in giving this show its voice? And I also want to know, also as you answer the question, as you're thinking about the answer, how does this show contribute to changing the perception about Lifetime and the reality that it is as capable of delivering a quality drama as any other network? I mean, I think when we were on set, you're not sitting around thinking about what network you're making the show for. You're just trying to do a good job and do the best work you can. And if anybody ever said anything like about Lifetime, you're like, it's, it's stop, like it's a good show. And now with so many platforms, like we talk about all the time, a good show can exist anywhere. And the content was so rich that it, it didn't, it was like they, w the fact that they snatched it up as fast as they did it w was, I felt uh, very inspiring that they knew it. They knew that they had something and Lifetime specifically and a &E, uh, were so supportive. And I mean, Sarah can speak to that more, but we felt it on the set. I mean, we were reading scripts and we, could not believe that 
we were reading them and then shooting them and they were staying in the show. You know, we all would say, oh no, that's never gonna, they'll never, they'll never put that on television. That, and then we would go <laughs> to looping and we're, oh my God, that scene's <laughs> still on the show. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, going into South by Southwest was this thing that I had been working on for essentially 10 years in my head, five years in real life. You know, it was like absolutely my baby and my life's work. Um, and flying down pretty much on a whim to meet with Nina, with Sally, just sort of like, yeah, of course, you know, I really want to make it a series, let's go talk to Nina. It was nowhere in my head that it would end up at Lifetime. I mean, I definitely, going into South by Southwest, was looking forward to meeting with Netflix and HBO and all the other places that I would probably want to sell a premium cable kind of show. Um, but for me, it really just came down to Nina. It was like, I'm now I'm gonna fucking cry. Mm -hmm. See, oh I know. none of us can, none of us can look at each other. <laughs> it's ridiculous. You guys, it's a really good show. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay, so let's try to do this without crying. But um, I think you know I'm a pretty good judge of character. I would say that for probably all the people on the stage. Um, and Nina looked me in the eye, and she, I just believed her completely. And um, I didn't have an agent. I didn't really know anyone in town. So I called a couple, the couple people I knew. It was like my cousin was a screenwriter in the 80s or something. I called her. Um, <laughs> I, I, I called, uh, I called uh, there were a couple people th through AFI. I did the directing workshop for women there. Um, two people had written on TV shows. I called them, and I'm like, what the fuck do I do? I was like, what do I do? I just don't understand what's happening. Um, and the feedback, unanimous among all three people I spoke to, uh, was that really passion is the most important thing, that um, the worst case scenario is taking a project that close to your heart someplace where it's just gonna be in a pile of 45 and get a short shrift. And um, they really just said, you know, do you believe her? Do you, do you believe it? And I, I just totally do. I totally believe in Nina. And that, and she, it, that's it. And, I, um, for me, in terms of navigating the brand, it's been interesting for me because my communities and platforms are very much like indie film and film festivals, and a lot of my friends have looked at me sideways about being on Lifetime. Um, and I feel like the best, the most effective thing that I've found is to face it head on. I kind of address it really bluntly now, and I just kind of say, it's not what you'd expect. It's like an HB show. I mean, I just, I just have found that I just kind of have to go at it. And I, there's something for me also about being a feminist, a, card-carrying feminist that I am really, really excited to make outstanding content for a female forward network. And to be at a network where we didn't even have a conversation about having two female leads. It just wasn't even, we never had, of course, you know, there was no conversation. And, it's, and uh, it's one of the biggest female casts I have ever been a yeah. part of. And it was one of the most incredible sets I have ever been on. And I think, again, that is a testament to the studio and the network. Mm -hmm. There was, we all felt like we were supported 100%, no matter what we mm -hmm. were going to do as these characters. And that doesn't happen very often. And I think we all knew that because they were so supportive of all of us and mm -hmm. everything we were representing across the board, it just, it was such an incredible experience as well. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to say, full disclosure, Barry runs the studio. Bob DiPetetto, um heads up the studio, and Barry runs it on a day-to-day. -day and it, 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 this came about at the time that the studio was starting up. So it was an incredible experience to be able to work in-house mm. um, with our studio. And they, too, I mean, Barry did everything and bent over backwards with the team to make this an incredible experience. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's sort of the evolution from the moment with Nina to Nina sticking her neck out to bring in Marty Noxon, sticking her neck out to get Constance, and then Barry and his team coming on and just being our absolute guardians. I mean, like fighting for us night and day. It's just been a uh, really, truly unbelievable experience. I, I can't imagine anywhere else we could have made the show. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have your period, Barry? Uh, no. So um, here's a quote from Forbes. Uh, I think this was the first review that we all saw, yeah. and we were sharing it over emails. <laughs> and we and, and we all cried. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sending it to our mothers, the whole thing. So here's what Forbes wrote. Instead, the world behind the camera is one of lies, deceit, grandstanding, manipulation. And it's hard to portray that world with characters the audience can also sympathize with. And that's where Unreal succeeds brilliantly. So those are huge words. So. 
in that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of mention of morality, and I think morality plays a big, you know, plays a big part in the show. So how does it factor into the decision? I'm, now I just want to talk about like what's going on inside the show. Mm -hmm. How does morality factor into the decisions the characters make? More to the point, the producer's sole responsibility is to get the best footage possible. Or is it that they should at least consider the ramifications of their actions? What's going on there? And I see Sarah shaking her head, so I'm going <laughs> to let you jump right in on that one. Um, well, I think morality is kind of it's the it's what the whole show is kind of about. There's a there's an idea that like mill millennials are kind of post moral. I don't know if you guys have heard this, but like morals are no longer they kind of no longer exist. Um, and the notion of selling out no longer exists because it's all about self pu self publishing and self promotion. There's really it's kind of quaint to have morals. It's very like cute. Um, and I am of the mindset that primates who don't live by uh, some sort of code that they c that's consistent actually lose their minds. I actually think that people completely untethered will go insane. And so that's kind of the founding premise of the show is like we're adrift at this point that we're post moral, but we can't actually live that way. So it's I think it's I think it's really really important. And one thing about the Rachel character, we literally put her um, character central conflict on her chest because <laughs> we're like. <laughs> Don't want anyone to miss it. You know, she's a feminist working on a, a very sexist show. So it's clear to us that that is, again, like kind of Faustian. It's a battle for her soul in a very clear way. She's, she's confronting it every single day. Um, and then the thing about Quinn is that she's the only person in the whole equation being honest. She just tells it like it is. And so the question is, is somebody deluding their self that they're a good person, more moral, or somebody who's just confronting what's real, more moral? And that, like that, <laughs> like that thing. Them, um, I call uh, Shiri and Constance's character emotional serial killers. <laughs> so um, it's interesting. So you, you're all successful women in show business. Along the way, have you guys faced similar moral challenges that Rachel and Quinn have? And if so, uh, do you think these challenges are more heightened for women in entertainment? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Uh, I told you we did the Canada part early. I wanted to get right. That. No, I, I mean. <laughs> I think there's challenges as a woman in any field, and but I do believe that it's changing and it's shifting. And as far as moralistically, I feel like every job I take, there's a question of why am I doing this? Who am I doing this for? Mm -hmm. Who am I representing? Who am I misleading? Y you know, we're we're actors. We we dive into our characters and w we get all mixed up in it. And you know, it's it's interesting when you get to a part in a place in your career where you've done certain characters and you're like representing real people. Even though that, like I don't know, I didn't meet anybody who is Quinn King because I don't want to know that person. <laughs> but you know. I think that all I want as an actor is to be relatable to someone. For you to do a performance in a show that will touch somebody somehow, somewhere. And that's it, and then we've done our job. So I had a hard time with Quinn in the beginning until I w was able to, to find her heart and her place and it's not necessarily like moralistically am I doing things in my career that I don't agree with. I've definitely taken parts in the beginning of my career that are no longer on my resume <laughs> because I don't think people need to know that I did that crap. But you know, in the beginning of your career, you're, you're trying to just get your foot in the door. So you will do things that people tell you to do that you don't believe you should do. Like, doing a maxim centerfold As because people said I wasn't pretty enough and I had to take off my glasses and I had to show the world that I was pretty. And I was like, but I'm, I'm, that's not what I do. I'm not that person. I don't want to be that person. But my agent's telling me, but that's what you have to do because people want to know that you're pretty, but you're playing characters that aren't. And I was like, I, I don't know what you're talking about right now, but you know, okay, fine. So it's like that kind of stuff. Yes, I, that's where it definitely crosses into like being manipulated by the people around you to do things that they think will catapult your 
his career. So I mean, that to me is probably the closest thing that was, and now it still comes back and haunts me today. So it's frustrating. You know, you can't in a day right now in technology, people can find everything you've ever done and you know now you have to like talk about it. Well, yeah, I did do that. What do you want me to say? You know, sure, it is. whatever. I would just say like having worked like my whole life basically. I would say like my late teens through my twenties. That question came up a lot. I was told to get a boob job. There was a lot of jobs that if I had been sexier, willing to take my clothes off, my career would have been further along. But now that I'm like you know in my thirties, I'm a grown woman. I don't feel like the question comes up as much because I think my morals and my values and my code of ethics are so much stronger. And you know, I passed on all those things as my 20s because I really felt like my dignity was more important and hopefully would carry me through. Um, so I think it's challenging. I don't know if it's more challenging for men. I just don't know that they're asked to do those, those roles I don't think exist for men in the same way that they do for women. So um, I want to talk about creativity for a moment, but I have to quote, I have to quote one more review. It's from the Los Angeles Times. <laughs> It plays into you, what you guys You're like are like our great do. uncle that comes over. It's like over awesome. Like, I, I, it's our favorite game right now. He's like, oh my God, <laughs> cheery. Wait, listen, okay. did you read actually, that article? This go is ahead. actually about you guys, okay? So it's, this is what LA oh, Times go said. Ahead. Go Built ahead. Built on yeah. a pair of strong, nuanced, cliche-free performances by Shiri Appleby as Rachel, the conflicted Shapiro stand-in, <laughs> and Constance Zimmer as Quinn, her cynical boss, this is a lifetime series that transcends the word, the words lifetime series. So here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna pair you guys up. Yeah. So Sarah and Shiri, uh, the conflicted, who is Rachel? She's conflicted according to the LA Times. Mm -hmm. Is she really your stand in like, and you know, one other thing, why did she come back to Everlasting and like what makes her stay? What's going on there? Just a, a view ahead you of. You have to watch the show, Barry. Well, we want to. <laughs> We're trying to encourage well, viewership here. Basically, she, I mean, Sarah, please feel free no, to please jump in at any time. Let's tag team this You answer. and Nina get to yeah. do Quinn but together. Rachel comes back because at the end of the last season, she had a meltdown, and she go, and she steals this like Maserati or something. She calls the job Satan's asshole. Yeah, she gets crazy, mm -hmm. and she goes to jail. She crashes the car. Mm -hmm. Quinn gets her out of the situation by going to the court and getting everything taken away, but basically saying that she has like conservative rights over me and I have to basically pay off my debt to the show, which is about 10, blackmail, it's called it's, blackmail. It's about $10,000, <laughs> which I don't have any money at this point. So I'm back at the show trying to pay off my debt. And that's what really is keeping me around. I'm literally like locked into the show and I don't really have anywhere else to go. I'm living in the back of the grip truck. I don't have any friends, I don't have family and I don't really have an escape route. There's no other alternative. But so what we come to find out is that's kind of BS because there's another reason why she's back, which is that she has nowhere else to be, which is sort of what you were hitting on in the end. Um, and I think that um, one thing that we explore a lot, or that I definitely thought about a lot in thinking about this show, is um, the idea that agency is really scary, that you d have to make decisions in your own life is terrifying, and that being um, a like, sort of indentured servant to a job you hate is actually easier, because you can just be mad at your boss all the time. And what's really terrifying is to stand up and say, no, I'm an adult who's gonna decide something else. Mm -hmm. um, and that Rachel is paralyzed by too many choices and she's also paralyzed by being really good at being a horrible person and being really manipulative. And lastly, that it feels really good to belong somewhere. Like mm -hmm. even if it's a bad place, she has, she knows her job, people appreciate her for what she does, she gets paid for what she does and she has somewhere to show up every day. And not to underestimate how comforting that is to humans as animals, just to have a tribe and a place to be. So, I feel like I'm getting a biology lesson here today also. Mm -hmm. um, Sheree, I've heard you say a few times to me something, I wrote it down, Rachel would not say that. You would get script pages, they would come in various okay. colors. And then I'd be like, yeah, she would. <laughs> Do they really I, say that? No, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't really remember saying that. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm okay. Then we're gonna move on because okay, I was cool. gonna. Okay. No, I would. I'm gonna. I'm gonna grab that. I Go think, ahead, take it. Because you know your character. That's really what I'm. No, that's what I was gonna say. Is that this was the amazing thing about working with both Sherry and Constance is that they own these characters so deeply, and really, it's a first year show. And you know, we have a writers' room, and there's different people writing, and we're we're jamming and we're moving fast. And I welcome and like look forward to those conversations with these guys, honestly, because um, they invested. Like, I, again, just more than I could have ever imagined the amount that these guys devoted to these characters. 
that um, it was a conversation and a collaboration the whole way. So yeah, sometimes when we were jamming really fast and somebody else wrote pages and it felt a little off, oh, or maybe yes. not me ever. <laughs> it was never me. I recall. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> My yeah. integrity is restored. Yes, Thank I, you. I recall so, you're uh, correct there. You're so, uh, <laughs> Dina, we're gonna we're gonna Dina and Constance. So Quinn is interesting. She objectifies people, right? Villain, tearjerker, wifey, and I don't remember if I have the words in the right order here. Tranny, lumberjack, lumberjack, tranny. We cut that. Uh, oh, we cut <laughs> that. Okay, you guys. Okay. So, um, and then I noticed also yesterday we learned like uh, that a journalist related to Quinn's character, the one that Faye Dunaway played in Network, which is Huge, huge praise. So who is Quinn and where is she going? <laughs> Oof, I don't know where she's going. That's that's what's kind of been incredible about this journey is, you know, we would get the script. We only got to see two scripts at a time. So a lot of times, Shiri and I would read the scripts and I would say, oh, I can't, what, are you really gonna do that? What? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, uh, what? How do we go from here? You know, so it's like we were developing, kind of developing the characters as we went and not really knowing what our end was. So we had to be fully immersed in the present and what we were doing only for two episodes at a time. So I was constantly amazed and confused and inspired and disheartened by what Quinn was capable of in one episode and to then see how much it affected her in another episode. And I feel like Quinn is a character where the sky is the limit. I mean, and I think we're all ready. It's funny, watching the show, I've only seen four episodes. Obviously I know what happens, you guys. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> But I remember the first episode I saw and I thought, I was always so scared that Quinn was so mean and, and watching the first episode, the first thing I thought was like, oh my God, I could be meaner. So that was kind of an exciting thing as an actor, something that I was so afraid of, but then seeing as it was all put together uh, with everybody else, it makes me kind of excited that we can even go further, which is scary, but like ready, willing, and able. <laughs> you know, I, I think you, <laughs> women, people are flawed, and we are all good at some things and not good at others, and I think that what we wanted to do was really focus on the behind the scenes characters, the producers, Quinn um, and Rachel, and, and to really acknowledge that they were great at things and you know that love, was, love is, is tough and that Quinn can be vulnerable and confused about her own life and her own way of looking at love and relationships, despite the fact that she's making a fairy tale that people are supposed to believe is love. Um, and I think that that's exactly that, those, those themes. Um, so many people in this world, you know, we all, we all go to work and we have jobs and we have to be and play this role at work. The truth is, we don't always make the best decisions in our personal lives and, and at work. And I think that that's what we really tried to show. And I think in the pilot, um, there's a scene at the end when Rachel gets spit on by, um, by the person who's eliminated and there's a shot of, of Quinn and you feel it. You feel it and you see her vulnerability at that time and you see her feeling terrible. And I think that that's what the show does, it shows that people are vulnerable and you never know when it's gonna come out and the roles we play are the roles we play and don't judge us by that. Thank you. So um, they wanna take the mic out of my head. May I ask, ask one more question? Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna tie it together though, I had two, but I'm gonna make them one. It's great. And I think it's, it's great, really- by the way. This is what? great. Thank you. It's great. So um, <laughs> I feel great. we know that TV's, you know, look, they said masterclass, okay, so. Love it. So TV's changing. And, and we're part of it, Art and Real is part of it. And you know, it premiered last Monday. Uh, as you guys know, by the end of the week, uh, the Lifetime leadership decided to put the next three episodes on its streaming sites for people to binge watch or you know, watch the what, what, when they wanna watch in the way they wanna watch. Um, I've also noted, I, I, at dinner last night, I watched all of you guys um, 
tweeting while the live tweeting while the show was on the air. So uh, you know, I'm just curious, like you know, what are you seeing in terms of how we communicate to you know to our potential audience that our show is here? It's something they should check out. It's something they may want to watch. And as part of it, you know, like it seems like part of what's going on now is that you're engaging directly with the, with the audience. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think? Uh, any comments just about, you know, just the changing landscape of how we make sure people know that our show is there and it's something they may actually want to check out? I'm, I mean, what I will say is that I know that a lot of casting goes on now and one of the things that's being considered along with your resume or your body of work is like what is your social media following and you know if it's exciting or stressful or whatever it is it's just the way the world is working now so as an actor these live tweets even though they are time consuming it's helping us as an actor build our brand um, and get the word out and get the support for the show it's definitely, I feel like people are now kind of expecting it with shows. I know Shonda Rhimes has made it so popular with her shows mm -hmm. and it's really worked, but it's really the way people want to watch TV and they want to engage. I think, I, I, I just think that people feel that they have a connection now with people that they never could get close to. So there's a little bit of a, a blurred line uh, it's it's hard uh, as an actor that part of your job is you know the convincing but you know but to get people to watch your stuff but you know we all have to do that we all have to convince everybody to see anything we do whether it's your art or whether it's you know come to my kids play it's just it is the world is changing and I think the releasing the first four episodes was once again a way of you guys showing that you're willing to also change and embrace the way the world is viewing television and viewing things in, in general. And we all have to do it. We all have to compromise and understand, again, our limits and the lines that we're willing to cross and do. And you know, it's, it's dangerous too, because you're in connection with people who can tell you like, oh, I hate your voice and you're annoying. And I'm like, okay, great. But then you're in, con <laughs> you know, and then you're in connection with people that are like, you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it's kind of like, if if we all know and we're aware of it, then we use it. You know, where everybody is using everybody these days, and I think that just we're trying to show that Lifetime is rebranding. They're embracing. We're compromising. We're all doing our part. And this, and and I think Unreal represents it as well. Like we're opening uh, eyes into the scenes of worlds that people have never kind of seen. I mean, reality television is such a big bohemoth thing. And I think that it's all kind of working together. We're bringing the reality to the people, to the audience. We're also showing people the behind the scenes. And so I think that again, you know, a &E and Lifetime, I think you guys have done a really good job of showing how willing you are to step in it and just show everybody that we're willing to you know, make change. So I just have to ask, we want to hear from you guys, but we just have to ask you to be brief because I guess they yeah. need to. Go. I was gonna, well, I was just gonna say last <laughs> night at, at dinner, I think I said to Nina, um, that I feel like television has sort of replaced baseball as the national pastime. It's like what people talk about. They're really invested in it. They know a lot about the business. Their tastes are super sophisticated. And I feel like the appetite for really premium cable kind of um, programming is, is really, really high. And people want that, but the only way they're gonna believe it's worth watching is if they hear it from somebody else. And so what I was thinking about with that Twitter back and forth last night was that we're just creating ambassadors. We can't go into their workplaces on Monday morning and say, oh my God, I'm not kidding you guys, you should really watch it. I know it's on Lifetime, blah, blah. We need to create those people to have those conversations for us because that's that it's we can't be in every workplace. And I know for me, it takes, five of my friends telling me to watch something before I'll actually do it. Nina? You guys have done a hell of a job. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, look, the best shows are about something. The best shows are about our social commentary on our society and, and really hold a mirror up to what we are doing and who we are in this world. And I think that this show really has come at a time when people are looking at the world of reality and they're looking at you know, everything we're doing and the relationships between men and women and love and it really, you're gonna marry the guy who just slept with seven women the days <laughs> the last few days. Um, I think it's time to, to, to really hold, hold up 
hold it up and, and really talk about this um, because this is ubiquitous in our society and it just, it just, so you have to talk about it and that's the, sh the best show that can do it. Nina, Sarah, Constance, Sherry, thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Barry.